Welcome to the game show called This Is Your Life. Um, it's at this important critical juncture in our lives that we hear a record scratch and demand what terrible mistakes we've made to lead to us being on stage here. Let that sink in. <laughs> um, okay, well, welcome Stuart, John, Thomas, Charbel, Sam. Okay, for our first important life-changing question. What is the best thing out of WWDC for security? One thing that you've heard. John. Um, we're going to talk about passkeys, but honestly, it what? is good that they did uh, mention all of the uh, new features for relying parties. I think that, uh, you know, Fido Alliance, Microsoft, Apple, Google, all pushing for that adoption for passkeys. There's no way that would have happened unless there was um, some coordination there. And I think that the third parties, uh, like 1Password, LastPass, all these password managers, um, they're going to be able to leverage some of the features that were announced at uh, the last WWDC for, um, for managing uh, passkeys. So I think that's, that's really great. Like, they very easily could have made it much more difficult and uh, Apple, uh, making things difficult? And I would say, like, related, the developments in managed Apple IDs with pass keys, um, you know, like I, I spoke about it, it's, it's not something you're going to be able to implement overnight at a large organization, but it's progress. And I think a lot of us complained for a long time, like, hey, what are managed Apple IDs good for? Or like, show us value so we'll put in the effort to do the migration. And we're getting closer. And, and I promise I'm not stealing your answers, but I was going to say pass keys, too. <laughs> I, I, I just really like the idea, and I, I want to use them myself more. And um, I'm, I just can't wait for more places to support them. So. I'm going to say Sonoma introduces some new exciting endpoint security stuff. Um, you have events on sudo and su, and open directory users create and group create. And there's a new thing called launch constraints, which I haven't looked into. But I think you can restrict apps and environment variables. So, All right. Stuart? I was going to mimic Shafrol's. Uh, one, but I, I knew that right. I knew that you were going to be able to uh, say it more eloquently than me. But uh, yeah, the new e endpoint security events I think will be huge um, in allowing third parties to get more telemetry, more information on what's happening on the endpoint. Okay, here's a, an easy one, maybe, um, and we'll go into the second harder part, but. Um, as a macOS researcher, imagine if we were a macOS researcher and malware uh, lover. Um, is it easy or does it, does it help anyone to obfuscate the malware that is being blocked and make, does Apple making the lives of malware researchers, uh, researchers difficult by obfuscating all of that and what are they helping and um, yeah. That's a really good question. Uh, because I've thought of that myself, like like I showed kind of all those YAR rules, most of them have these random names. And if you run them through like a virus totals, YAR engine, or reversing labs, you can get some general idea of like this malware family is ad load or X set, et cetera. Um, and so it's a pain to have to do that. But at the same time, I think part of Apple's idea is to not allow or to try to hide the fact that they are detecting that malware from the malware authors knowing as well. Um, so like I, in the past, put out lots of blog posts on like, Xprotect released this new version two hours ago. It's blocking this. And also having the simultaneous thought of, well, maybe now these threat actors know that Apple's blocking it, so they're going to change it slightly. They're just waiting for Whatever. Stuart's blog post. Yeah. <laughs> I'm on their quick uh, yeah. RSS to the red list. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I think it's kind of a pro and con 
Okay. Thomas, a thought if that's a... Yeah, um, I, I think there's a part, there's, there's some of that when I think about the way that they're obfuscating it, but really the, like the, the way that those rules are obfuscated is pretty basic. Um, and I think that if you were a malware author and you wanted to figure out if Mac OS is blocking your stuff, the easiest way to do it is not even bother with looking at the rules, just run your crap on a Mac OS device and see what happens. Um, it's actually one of the, my biggest pet peeves when I go to, you know, take a look at a piece of malware. Um, you know, if Apple has already found it, I basically can't do anything with it. Like, I, I mean, I can open it up in, in, you know, Hopper or something like that and look at the, the assembly code. But if I want to run it and like, see, okay, this is what it drops. This is, these are the servers it communicates with and that sort of thing. It's like, no, sorry, you can't run that. It's, it's malware. You can only move it to the trash. So I kind of wish that for us researchers that Apple had a researcher mode where you could allow that sort of thing, but. Um. Okay. Second part of my question, everyone can take a stab at, but does Apple need to completely rethink its security architecture and is it making any sense with Gatekeeper, GateXProtect and all these bolted on afterthoughts that seem like every day there's a Chaba or other, uh, you know, TCC bypass or other bypass that if you're, if you're making a system that is easily bypassable, uh, then I don't know. I, I definitely have thoughts on that. I think, um, and I have said this repeatedly over many years, Gatekeeper, XProtect, et cetera, none of it is at all bulletproof. You know, it's, it's definitely far from infallible. However, I do think that Apple's in a really awkward position. I mean, they are constantly like pushing that monopoly lawsuit boundary. Um, if they were to go and say, hey, we're going to say that Matt Keeper is bad and we're going to block that, they're going to get their pants suit off and they're going to lose because they own the ecosystem. So I, I think that they, their tools do solve a problem, but they aren't ever going to be able to solve the entire problem uh, because of legal issues, fears of false positives, uh, and that sort of thing that really could give Apple a significant black eye and maybe even cost them a lot of money. Um, so honestly, I think that they're doing a great job with what they can do. Um, and it's really up to third parties to do the rest, and it probably always will be. Charvel, you're building your own tools there? Yeah. Terminator. Uh, I echo that, and I think Apple is in a tough spot, and uh, I've been critical of them, but I think they're doing whatever they can with the situation they are in to kind of mitigate things. and. It's also like, do you want Mac OS to be like iOS where like everything is like 10 times harder to do? And I personally don't. No. Um, so there's that balance to be struck and we don't know what that balance is yet. Uh, and I think this also has a door open for like third party uh, apps and people who do endpoint security to kind of have a little bit of that say like, okay, this is how a Mac should be secured, or this is my take on it, rather than Apple saying, run this, don't run that. I mean, John? Oh, um, I, I don't think this will ever happen, but um, you know, I think back like Firefox and m many other programs where there's like extended support release and this idea that security updates are separate from feature releases. And, um, and I think they're, they're kind of doing a little bit of that with RSR, I think. That's maybe like the first baby steps. It would be nice if there was more transparency about that stuff. And, um, but I think that, again, I don't think that would happen, but that would be such a game changer if we could more silently remediate um, things that they've already discovered in a more user-friendly way, in a more admin-friendly way. Um, you know, I don't know if enterprise admins are dying for a different feature update to 
you know, Keynote or all the things in Mac OS that's a package these days. This, um, you know, I don't want to know tips. You yeah. heard it here, folks. Yeah. Mac admins are dying. Yeah, but um, uh, but being able to get what we really care about, and I think it's security, um, that would be that would be incredible. That would I think be the best thing about the RSR, the Rapid Security Release, was that it installed and installed pretty easily. I still have laptops that refuse to update. So software update, Apple. Uh, security through updates. Haha. Uh -huh. Stuart. I I don't have too much to add. I mean, these guys said it really well. Um, I, a lot of Apple's security stuff in a lot of ways is meant to be overridden. Like Gatekeeper, as much as it blocks nefarious things, like all you have to do is like right click it and hit open and it overrides it. Um, which is a purposeful design to allow people to like use programs that aren't necessarily signed. But then you have malware like Schlayer who's built their whole reputation on fake Adobe Flash Player, and when you open it, it says right click the app and then click open, and you've overridden Gatekeeper on accident or whatever. Um, but mostly, I mean, just what, what these guys said, yeah. Sam? So, it's off. It's off. All right. Well, it's on now. Um, it's, it's on. <laughs> it's on. Um, so I've been pondering lockdown mode and like what the future of that might look like. Um, Apple did announce that it's expanded to watch OS, which is interesting. It just tells time now. Yes. <laughs> I mean, Classic OS. Uh, I do YOLO install all the all the betas on the first day. Um, my my watch did get more. It it got more secure because the battery didn't last any longer. <laughs> uh, but like with future enhancements to lockdown mode, could that be something that normal people could or would want to use um, to kind of guard against like to to make the blast radius of I mean things the lockdown not sounds as bad. better than reduced attack surface or something, you know. Just to have a marketing lockdown. The newest from Apple. Do less. Yeah. I mean unfortunately there's too much JavaScript on the internet that just destroys your computer. So maybe you don't want to run lockdown mode because you need pages to render quickly, but yeah, I think, like, what might the future of lockdown mode look like in five years? To, to chime in on that just a little, one of the gripes I have with lockdown mode was the way Apple marketed it. And the fact that they were like, for the security researcher who cares about the utmost security, and they really didn't seem to try to market it at all to a standard user. Uh, and I think that was a, a, a swing and a miss. Um, for people who do care about security but don't maybe consider themselves security researchers, uh, it would be great to see them push that down to like standard and user level. I mean, I think if they did the marketing of uh, you're targeted by a nation state, use lockdown mode. I mean, like a good magazine campaign or you know some web ads. Is there anything that Apple needs to do to improve the security or that could be easily done? What's one thing? Make bigger, more expensive watches? <laughs> they should fund Mac DevOps and uh, code, code boot camp so everyone can start building their own Terminator tools like Charvel. Um, can Apple do anything? You know, what's one thing they can do today? They make it really hard to do any kind of incident response. File a feedback on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, even just simple things um, such as the way different, like if you collect things from the sys log, it's in like, let's say UTC. But if you collect timestamps from Safari, it's in epoch time. And if you collect it from 
something else, it's in CF absolute time. Like, and I'm not even exaggerating. That's no, this is true. That's not an example. Uh, and so to actually respond to an incident and actually look at the timestamp of things happening, you have to go through all these convert time conversions and script it out and all that. Um, and that's really frustrating when you're when you have a user who something happened with and you're trying to react quickly. Make time normalization normal again. Mm. Yes. I want that shirt. Yes. Yeah, you know, along those lines, um, uh, I definitely think that there are things that, you know, third parties would love to be able to do that we really can't do right now. And I think uh, the fact that endpoint security even exists, like this framework that Charvel was talking about earlier, the fact that that even exists shows that Apple is interested in supporting third-party tools, third-party security tools. Um, they wouldn't, you know, like there, there was a lot of uh, theorizing a few years back that, you know, Apple was just going to kill all security tools and lock down Mac OS, et cetera. Like endpoint security solidly proves that's not the case. They built that from scratch to support third-party tools. Um, but I wish that they would extend it a little bit more and give some additional capabilities. Um, as one example, once upon a time, you used to be able to look at memory in Mac OS. Now, I understand why you can't today. That's dangerous. There's all kinds of stuff in memory that you don't want just anybody looking at. But it sure would be nice because sometimes there's fileless malware. Sometimes you might have something that was executed, the file was deleted, and it's just running in memory, and you really can't look at that. Um, so it would be nice to have some additional capabilities like that that are locked down under very strict entitlements that you have to be at a security company or something similar to get. I'd love to see that kind of stuff grow. And who knows, Apple might have plans for doing that kind of thing. I, I don't know, but um, that would be my wish. That's a good one. Yeah. I want that. <laughs> Since um, security for a lot of us involves sometimes spelunking, but then also automating and trying to do it across a fleet, is there anything that can make our lives better for Sam, John, and everyone who's trying to build tools or just manage a fleet and secure or lock down. Is there anything that we should be doing that's better than just a phishing campaign and try to trick our users? You know? what, what can we do? I, I think just simply it's make it really easy for users to do the right thing. And that's kind of it. Like phishing campaigns are interesting, but you know that, like, if you're running internal, um, like phishing simulations, you know that some percent of your company is going to fall for it. Like, maybe you can change that percentage, but it's not going to change to zero. So, um, make everything that you have easy to do the right thing, and users will generally follow that. Hopefully. John, any thoughts? Yeah, I, 100%. I, there's no, like, someone asked a question about knowledge factors and if it was so infinitely complex, like, would that still be secure? And the reality is the moment the user is involved, there's an element of, like, password reuse, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, one thing I didn't mention on the, the passkey talk was, when your uh, knowledge factors are uh, stolen, bought, fished, however it is, you're never notified. If someone's actually trying to compromise your iCloud account and the pass key, uh, iCloud keychain or your Google password manager, there are things that actually let you know, hey, you're trying to sign in from a different device, so on and so forth. That never happens when your knowledge factor is stolen. That's just, you have no idea. So to your point, it's like, don't even let them have that option. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> you know, getting rid of passwords and forcing security keys is a perfect example, right? Um, yeah. Any questions from the audience? Um, yeah, okay. Why don't we 
Mando, start from the back and uh, work our way. We've got time for two questions. I need to see those hands again. Right, I saw you first. I'm just <clears throat> sorry. I'm just curious. Uh, Apple has obviously come a long way in the last couple of years with their security profile. Is there anything from the Windows or Linux side on security that you would like to see Apple implement into their platform that exists in another platform? No. Um, I, I, so I hear that question a lot, but from a slightly different perspective. So the question I get a lot is, why don't you do this on Mac OS? And like for us, for Malwarebytes, the big questions are like, why don't you do anti-ransomware on Mac OS? And I'm like, well, what ransomware? Like, there isn't any. Like, there have been a few failed attempts, but like, so I don't know that it necessarily makes a lot of sense to say, okay, because this thing exists on Windows, it has to also exist on Mac OS. I'm sure that somebody could probably come up with some things that are nice on, you know, Windows that, you know, would be nice to have on Mac OS, but like my, my lens is a little skewed because I'm always getting it the other way. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I think that's kind of the wrong approach in my head. Like if I'm Apple, like I have iOS, that's very nicely locked down. I would borrow things from iOS and that's been happening on Mac OS. I don't need to look at Windows. I don't need to look at Linux. Uh, Apple owns the silicon, Apple owns, like it's vertically integrated. Uh, so I think they're at an advantage. They have better boot security. I would make an argument for that. Uh, so I think they're in a position where they don't need to look, they just need to look at their other OS. So th there's one very specific thing for me, and it's not from Windows, um, it's from Android, and that is work profiles. Um, so user experience on iOS is crucial. Um, I think, to, you know, Apple had a talk at WWDC like, three years ago about like how device management needs to change and you know companies shouldn't be fully controlling their employees like BMOD phones but user enrollment just has never really taken off it's not the best user experience I'm not going to claim that Android work profiles are perfect but they actually work they're actually pretty great um, and that's that's what I would truly be looking for. Um, I think back to a previous life where the iPhone was out, but MDM didn't exist, and BlackBerry was kind of falling aside, and there was this company called Good, and they made the Good Client, and it was like a self-contained email and calendar and stuff for your iPhone. It was not a very good product, but like to be able to have your work things kind of contained in a work bubble that you can turn on and off easily is something that I really want to have on my iPhone, but I carry an Android phone for work stuff to have a work profile on. I don't put work things on my iPhone because still it's not ready for it. Another question, Chris? Yeah, this is a great segue from Sam's comments there. Like BYOD is a reality and we talk about, you know, how we secure a fleet of managed devices, but then you throw in BYOD. How do we acknowledge and I hate to say it, manage that that reality, that mixed fleet? We say no. We just say no. <laughs> Uh, BYOD, how do you manage that? Um, is that an issue? Do you allow BYOD in your enterprise or? Yeah, so I, I can talk a little bit about how we do it. Um, uh, I, I'm not in IT, but I'm the Mac guy that likes to pester IT a lot. So, <laughs> so I kind of know a little bit about how they work. And um, 
Uh, I'm also the guy who likes to break the rules. So I, I sometimes will push IT and say, hey, I want to do this. How do I do it right? Um, so like, I, the way that we do it is like when it comes to your laptop, it's, it's your work laptop. It's issued to you by the company. You don't put your personal stuff on it. You don't put your work stuff on your personal, you know, there's just that line. You just don't do it. And um, IT does what they can to enforce all that. When it comes to phones, it gets a little more awkward because like you've got to have 2FA to log in through Okta or whatever your portal is, right? You gotta have a phone for that. It's your personal phone. I mean, Malwarebytes doesn't issue any of us phones. Um, I'm, I, I haven't talked to anybody recently whose company issues them a phone. So that's where things get a little awkward. Um, the way that we do it is if you wanna put things like your calendar and your email and stuff like that on your personal phone, you have to also install this additional management app. Um, it's not full MDM, but it does some MDM-like things. I, I don't really understand how it works, but because I didn't install it on my <laughs> so. But that's like I, that seems like a pretty reasonable approach to me. Like if you want to put these certain things on your personal phone, you're gonna have to expect a little extra layer of inspection. Uh, but like for 2FA or whatever, I mean. You know, it's everybody kind of needs that, and you've got it for your personal stuff anyway. At least the folks in this room do. So, I don't know. That's kind of an awkward situation, though. Sam wants to speak yeah. again. So, the, I don't have an answer, but the, the thing this, that I've been kind of struggling with and having a good answer to, especially in the last three years or so, has been the extent of personal stuff on a work device. And there's just so many little cases where you're like, I'd like to be able to support that. Whether that's someone has AirPods and they want the like continuity to work, or you know, they just want to sign into Spotify, but they log into Spotify with Facebook. And it would be really nice to have like I don't know, a little personal bubble on, like just like user enrollment would, it would be great if work profiles existed in iOS, it would be nice if you could have like a little personal bubble, even if it was a little restricted personal bubble on, um, on the Mac. And I'd love to talk to anybody who's like <laughs> gone through this and have a thought experiment because you know, you see tons of people and they have all kinds of personal stuff on their work device and there's lots of implications there. And yeah. I don't want to make people carry two laptops, but I also want them to be able to, you know, listen to music while they work. <laughs> a so, noble, a noble effort, a noble yeah. cause. One more question, Mark, you had a question? No, I have a, um, oh, you want to? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I think when you look at that, it actually goes back to like your um, threat modeling. I feel like Alistair did a talk on that. I can't remember. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, threat modeling. Yeah. And you need to organizationally understand like what is your threat, what is the risk you're willing to accept and mitigate and document, and uh, that conversation with your organization of hey. Company data is a privilege, not a right. And if you want to access it on your personal, you do have to go through these uh, extra hoops, which is like a, a very reasonable thing. Although it does start to get logistically difficult of like, oh, well now you need to issue me a company device. And there are people who are afraid that it, this is gonna hurt productivity. If you're like, fine, then I won't have it on my, then I just won't have Slack on my phone. And you know, all organizationally, that's not a good strategy, right? Um, but I do like that idea because the answer is there will never be a separation of personal and work. It just, it just will never happen. I, I feel like the Android model makes a ton of sense and it's not perfect, but um, it works. yeah, yeah. Okay. Mark, you had a question? <clears throat> so Apple is constantly going back and forth trying to say, oh, we're an end user facing company. Oh, we have enterprise features back and forth and back and forth they go. And then, so what I wanted to hear from the panel was whether or not you think that this 
um, constant empowerment of the end user is a fool's errand because you know what we see is that people are basically faced with alert fatigue. You know they're not acknowledging those dialog boxes. They're just like you're in my way, you're in my way. Acknowledge, acknowledge. And and Apple is the primary cause of that. Like and that's why we need MDM, Mark, just to get rid of those dialog boxes and our users never see them. Right. That's that's why I set up MDM. But uh, yeah, okay. What? Enterprise, a fool's errand. Uh, you know, empowering the user. <laughs> this is a really good question, um, and it really kind of harkens back to Thomas's talk of like getting all these alerts, and people are just so used to clicking allow for this new calendar event or this new reminder that popped up, um, and then they all of a sudden get one from Safari and they click OK, and all of a sudden they're clicking on adware. Um, I don't know if it's a fool's errand. I, I can understand where Apple is coming from, trying to give the user as much insight into what's happening on their computer as possible. However, I don't think most people care. Like they just don't care as much. Like if if they install some program and it installs a launch daemon, it's not that doesn't really matter to them. They just want their program to work. Um, so I think there's kind of this threshold that maybe they've pushed past a little of what can give the user insight into their machine, but also not be so bombarding. Um, and like for me, I use functions of like focus to like when I'm working and even just like throughout the day to silence random applications from sending me notifications um, because I, I'm sure I would fall for it if I was just getting email, calendar, reminder, browser, uh, yeah. Um, that's my two cents. Yeah, so um, how many people in the room remember the I'm a Mac, I'm a PC ads? Do you know which one I'm talking about? You, you know the one, I've used it in a presentation before where Apple is poking fun at Microsoft for constant dialogues that they put into Windows asking to allow or deny. And, you know, they're, they're in this ad, you know, the Windows guy, he's got this bodyguard over his shoulder and he's like, you know, asking allow or deny constantly. And at the end of the ad, he's like, um, you know, Windows is having a sad realization, allow or deny. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the Windows guy's like, allow you know and that's kind of where we are with mac these days you know apple has done a lot of the same kind of allow or deny stuff and so i i wholeheartedly agree uh, with what you said Stuart. it's it's that it, that generates a lot of alert fatigue and and it causes a lot of problems with average folks non-technical folks who don't understand what it's all about they just want to get rid of it and say, come on, I'm, I'm busy. I want to play Candy Crush. Get the heck out of my way. Um, my wife has fallen for stuff like that before. You know, she's, she's allowed things she shouldn't have allowed just because she doesn't, she's not technical. She's very intelligent, not technical, doesn't like computers. And Tom, there you have it. Like, Thomas, it's, it's I, think, um, I think we've found a perfect way to wrap everything up because this idea of clicking allow or deny and this whole, we've, we've got to take inspiration from GitOps or DevOps and um, peer review. So nobody should be allowed to sign into a computer without actually naming a parent or a child, depending on your age. And, or a peer review colleague buddy that no button click, clicking or pressing will be allowed or they'll be logged and sent to your peer review buddy. And so no decisions can be made without your, your friend. No code should be checked in, no boxes should be checked without your friend. And if you're of a certain age, your children will be notified. And if, 
you know. If you click allow, you get a message, this incident will be reported. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, like the old pseudo message, like screen time. But I think, uh, you know, um, like with this conference, I've had to use sanity checking, you know, and get people to help me before I make silly decisions. I don't always heed those messages. But I think in more in uh, computing, we're going to not be allowed to use computers without our uh, peer review buddy. So, uh, Charbel, you're my peer review buddy. <laughs> wow. I, because forget normal folks who use computer, even us, like if I'm trying to get work done and something is asking for my credentials, 50 times I'll know it's a bad thing, but one time I'll trip and that's enough to fish the credentials and call me. Control Just call me. Yeah. Peer review. Buddy. Yeah, peer review. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and, uh, not the credentials, like the administrator account, right? You can fish that, install a malware, you're talking about like email credentials and things that support pass keys and talking about like local user accounts, gaining administrative privileges. So I can see a future where microphone. John can see a future. Yeah, I could I could see a future where like we have, you know, going back to eighty bound and federated accounts and so on and so forth, I could see something where you have pass keys that is actually very tied to just signing in to the local user account. Uh, Touch ID was supposed to kind of solve that for us. So I think there's, I, I agree, and that would be great. But like the persistence for malware on Mac is so easy right now. You can fool like an installer dialog, like, hey, I need to update, enter your password, and boom. You don't know whether that dialog is real or not. And if I hit that dialog 50 times to a user who's trying to get work done, they will trip at least once. So I hope it gets solved. I hope pass keys are the solution. But currently, like, it is so easy to get persistence. I think Sam is dying to give you a FIDO key or something. Yeah. <laughs> so yesterday, uh, Sonoma Beta 2 came out. And obviously, I updated from Beta 1 to Beta 2 on the only laptop that I brought with me. Um, and after I updated, um, you know, everything came up, and I could click around, and then I started to try to type. And no text box that <coughs> I tried to type in would work. Um, That's and I was true. like, did I miss some like TCC thing? And did I, like, an app has to be allowed to receive keystrokes to a text box? Like, legit, I, can, I thought that I got out my phone and I started like, did I miss this? Did I miss this? You bricked all your life. Um, it turned out to be a bug from clicking a menu bar icon I, I opened in Feedback Assistant. Um, hopefully it'll be fixed. But I honestly like, wouldn't have been surprised if there legitimately was like TCC for being able to type in an app. Well, so. And you bring up an interesting point. Um, because I know Nick went through this, and I have as well, but um, I've seen a newer-ish, I think, TCC option for something called installer. And if, if some user downloads something from the internet and goes to install it, if they accidentally deny the installer application, it just silently fails every subsequent install package you try to install. And uh, I've had people trying to install like the Huntress agent, and they can't figure out why it's not working. We have engineering involved, and then we realize someone at some point accidentally hit the deny button, and so every installer's failing. And it's, it's not a bug, it's a feature. We, yeah, we've seen that with our customers where the installer fails, and like for a while we didn't know why. We started to figure out if you, give the installer app full disk access, or if you move the install, like the, the .pkg to a different location, suddenly it works. And it's like, what the hell? Like, since when does installer need extra permissions? And why didn't it have them? And I'm wondering, like, you know, did somebody deny something that they shouldn't have? Or like, you know. There it is. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's the beginning of the end. You heard it here first. Okay. Well, one last word. Sorry. The last words. Uh, I mean, in in addition to all that, 
it, I, it's so frustrating for end users who aren't enrolled in an MDM because they're getting so many more pop-ups. Like if you can push down a profile that gives different applications access, like not only is it just like calendars and reminders, it's TCC. Say uh, you're a third party security solution, you want to install a system extension, give that permission, a network extension, give that permission, and then full disk access. Like you're giving the end user a lot of power in clicking allow on these things, clicking deny, and screwing things up in the process. Admin's doing the same thing if you're doing it remotely. Um, it, Apple's made it difficult to do those things and suppress those notifications if you're not on an MDM. It's yeah, you, near impossible. Yeah, absolutely need an MDM. It's the number one reason that I installed MDM and a lot of people do, just to get rid of those dialogs, is make sure things are installed that you want and get make people's lives easier, you know? I want to thank everybody. Thank you so much for volunteering to be guinea pigs on this game show. What do we win? What do you win? Who, who won? You won. You win a free trip home.